Thank you. So this is going to test your knowledge. You've learned some things, but also there's going to be some very unusual unknowns here. So let me present the first case and then we'll show the video. And uh, this video I had, but mine became corrupt, so I had to get one sent to me of the same thing. 28-year-old ulcerative colitis, two years on maintenance mesalamine, 4.8 grams for one and a half years. Two months of diarrhea presented and had suprapubic pain, three to five stools, some weight loss, no fever, mild bleeding. Physical exam uh, was unremarkable. And the interesting thing was she lived in Louisiana for 10 years and just moved to Philadelphia. She had no cigarette history. White count was normal. She was mildly anemic with an elevated CRP and a low albumin, and stool studies were negative. She was given 40 of prednisone for one week when she left, saying, you're going to go see Lichtenstein in Philadelphia. He'll take care of you. And uh, she did so. When she got to 10, she flared and is now on week eight of therapy, having three to five bowel movements a day, and a sigmoidoscope was done. And this is a sigmoidoscopy that was done at the time. Can you please uh, hit that for me? And uh, this is after prednisone for a while, and she was moved up on her prednisone. And it uh, looks pretty good. There's really good vasculature and good light reflex. And you go in, you see no activity. And you get to an area that looks a little inflamed, and then you go into that area and you see this. And uh, is that mucus on the lens? <laughs> she liked to eat sushi also, I didn't say. So we get... A lunch symposium next? Yeah, the lunch symposium next. So think of this when you're eating, guys. No. <laughs> this is sometimes thought of as such. Okay, so let's stop here and let's go on to the audience response question, the next one. Appropriate treatment options for this at this time, one single best answer. One, no treatment is needed. Two, let's give some fluconazole. Three, prasquintal. Four, iodoquinol, or five, albendazole. Whoa, you guys are good. So, so let's go through a little, albendazole. Um, so let's go through some of the data we have. And this is Trichoris trichuria. It's worldwide, about one billion infestations. It occurs in Asia, Africa, and South America. But in the US, it's relatively rare. But it's thought to occur in the rural Southeast. Uh, poor hygiene is associated with it. And children are more vulnerable in highly exposed areas. Um, the issue is this is something that uh, it's soil transmitted. It's a helminth, the third most common cause of roundworms in humans. And it causes infection and then it occurs in the feces and the fertilizer. They spread person to person, fecal oral, through the feces. People with heavy symptoms can get pain when they pass the stools. Rectal prolapse is associated with this. And the treatment is albendazole or mubendazole. These are the primary treatments. And it's usually treated within three days of treatment. So the key is Louisiana is a hotbed for this. And I learned this uh, afterwards. There are several areas in the United States where this is not uncommon. Another case. Philadelphia. Not Philadelphia. We don't see it there. 28-year-old, uh, ulcerative colitis, two years, maintenance mesalamine, 4.8 grams, one and a half year, diarrhea, two months. Comes in with three to five stools daily that are loose, pain, weight loss, no fever, blood. Uh, abdomen, soft, non-tender. Uh, this person lives in New Jersey, not Flint, Louisiana. There's a transposition, no cigarettes. Um, and the white count was elevated, uh, 10.8, CRP high, albumin low. Stool cultures were present, and they were negative. So here's your video. This is a shorter video. Could you please play this? And here you go. So you can see there's ulceration, there's inflammation present, and uh, this was in the stool oven parasite. So I called our laboratory and got a picture. And the other thing was seen, I took a biopsy, and the arrow shows you the abnormality, right here and there. 
So this is a board's question. Here we go again. Appropriate treatment options for this person. Anti-TNF therapy, because you have the ulcers, it's actively inflamed. Should you use steroids, high fiber diet and bulk laxatives, eficonazole or ivermectin? Number five, that's the answer. Great choice. So let's go through what this is. What is this, people? Strongyloides colitis. So this is a case of someone, and the places you get it are Tennessee, Kentucky, and Western Virginia, and Louisiana, and Puerto Rico. Tourists coming in from Southeast Asia, Central Europe, have a high incidence and prevalence of the disease. So it's very important when someone comes in with a diagnosis of colitis to get a biopsy, and also to do the stool studies in the appropriate individual. And it remains indolent for many years. When the patient gets corticosteroids or they become immune compromised for treatment of the disease, that's when it may become symptomatic and become apparent. So you can have this many years past and it doesn't have to be present. A recent study looked at this. It's more common in males. The median age is such that it's an elderly age where it presents more commonly. The immune system is, quote, less robust. Um, and then peripherally eosinophilus and see it only about two thirds. Steroid therapy in a large majority before and misdiagnosis 50 some percent and it's initially misdiagnosed as ulcerative colitis in about a third of cases overall. Mortality is high if not treated. The location of the disease can be throughout and the larvae in the stool is 100 percent. So a stool study is critical, very important. The infectious mimickers for ulcerative colitis, this audience is obviously very familiar. I won't belabor this, but it's important to do your biopsies and get your stool studies. Ivermectin and thiabendazole are superior to albendazole, and these are the treatments of choice for this. And those people that can't absorb it, you can give rectal ivermectin or subcutaneous. So it should be administered until you get resolution of symptoms in at least two weeks. Case three, ulcerative colitis, 25 years, again, about two months of diarrhea, three to four stools a day, suprapubic pain, no weight loss, no fever, no systemic signs. Physical exam, unremarkable, not a smoker, white count normal, hemoglobin normal, CRP normal, albumin normal, culture, C. diff negative, colonoscopy coming up, and a small bowel CT enterography was normal. Press this if you could. So here you go. So this is a colon. You can see this colitis. This person had a polyp resection in the past there, and this was uh, India ink for it. And you see a little abnormality here. It's you know hard to see clearly. Is there something concerning? So I went back and forth several times to get a better view, and um, then I'll do some narrow band to see if that detects it. Um, and then we're going to test you on what Dr. Rubin did here. You know this is something of concern perhaps, or maybe not. We're gonna come back very shortly here. This is your narrow band imaging. So you can see here, there's something there. Is it an inflammatory polyp? Is it more concerning? And then we'll do a little uh, methylene blue. And we're gonna pull back a little here and Look carefully at the pattern of anything here, see what it is. The old check PC card. And there you go. So that's the abnormality that was seen. So let's advance to the next slide, please. You had a good view of the area. Um, so what do you do? This is someone that has had a focal segment in uh, the setting of ulcerative colitis. Do you do total proctocolectomy, an endoscopic mucosal resection? The estimated size of that particular lesion was about 10 centimeters by 5 centimeters, if I had to estimate. Um, segmental colectomy or continued surveillance every six months, then annual after that. So 
So some would do EMR for a 10 centimeter by five centimeter lesion. Others would take out the colon and then you have some that would just still follow. So what we elected to do was to go ahead and to do surgery on this patient given the size of the lesion. I showed it to Greg Ginsburg in our group and he said this is concerning because if you look at the actual pattern that we had, it was uh, more a four if you look closely at the areas. And given it was a four on the modified KUDO criteria, then this is something that was concerning and given the size. And it turned out there was an invasive carcinoma in that that was present. So taking out the bigger lesions is sometimes not always the greatest. And there was a little nodularity in one of the areas you saw. It wasn't completely flat. And this person did well. And one of the things to reemphasize, when you see a polypoid lesion, things that are concerning for a malignancy, which we really haven't touched upon, are central umbilication. If it's firm or it's hard, when the uh, head is pushed up with a snare or a forceps, these are criteria that you say is concerning. If you see satellite lesions, these are more concerning as well. An irregular contour, so it's not flat. This was bumpy and not very clearly a flat, typical pattern. Focal ulceration, and if it's a very broad stalk concerning polypoid lesion, these are more concerning for carcinoma. These have not been put to the standard, and there's no risk stratification based on findings. The old saying is, you know it when you see it. But again, it's not something that's been well studied. So case four, 48-year-old female who's constipated for two years, diarrhea for two months, comes in, suprapubic pain, two to three loose stools a day, a little weight loss, five pounds, abdomen was unremarkable. She's a smoker, five years. White count normal, hemoglobin normal, CRP albumin stool studies unremarkable. Someone did a CT enterography beforehand. They were thinking this might be IBD or something else, uh, given some of the discomfort she was having with diarrhea, and that was also normal. So if we could start the video, please. So this is the anal virgin. We're pushing into the bowel. It's very close to the distal colon. And there you see something abnormal. We're going to come back to that and get a better assessment. That's about 10 centimeters in. And you really don't get a good view here. But we're going to go back in shortly and get a focal assessment. A lot of peristalsis in the colon. And we're going to come up to it here. So pay close attention. I'll try to point out where it's here. And they're going to see things all along there. These little areas here. There, 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 and there. These are the abnormalities you see. So now that you guys know everything about inflammatory bowel disease, this was a pathology. And you see a little denudation of the surface epithelium. You see some abnormalities here. We have another picture close up. So put on your boards hats again and think what this might be. And treatment, you're going to give anti-TNF therapy to this person, oral steroids, tell them to take some fiber and don't worry about it, or topical mesalamine. Well, Topical mesalamine is not your answer, so we're going to go through this. Those that voted for three are correct. Fiber and bulk. This is a classic case of solitary rectal ulcer syndrome. And the fibromuscular obliteration of the lamina propria was what I showed in the uh, pathology slides there. Um, they can present uh, as multiple most of the times, and one in four is single. So the 25% are single ulcers, and they can be ulcerated polypoid, you can get, and these are mimickers of Crohn's. So it's an important thing to know to differentiate. Um, you can get flat lesions as well. The most common is the ulcerated, and the ulcer is typically shallow, a white sloppy base, and a thin rim of erythematous mucosa, which is what these had. This is classic for the solitary rectal ulcer syndrome. They're anywhere from 4 to 12 centimeters from the anal verge, and they're anterior to the anorectal junction. And that's the classic location these are. And then the things you see microscopically are fibrous obliteration of the lamina propria, thickening of the muscularis mucosa, and you see regeneration and disorientation of the crip architecture. So to an unexperienced pathologist or endoscopist, these are things that are going to occur. And 
The association with rectal prolapse is very common that you can see. So you want to check for prolapse at the time of the scope as well. And it's overactive straining and puborectalis sling overactivity that it's thought to be a local ischemic type of event to the area. And the first thing you want to do is high fiber diet and bulk laxatives. And then if they don't work, then biofeedback, defecography, and then look for prolapse directly to see and treat these patients accordingly. So the last case I'm going to present, 48-year-old new onset diarrhea for two weeks, prior ulcerative colitis for five years in remission on 2.4 grams of mesalamine pancolitis. Had some cramping in the suprapubic region, two to, loose stools, two to three loose stools a day, no cigarettes, no ethanol, no illicit drugs. Laboratory studies were all unremarkable. Stool studies unremarkable. A small bowel CT enterography a year prior was normal. And this is what was found. All these little white spots here. What are they? Markedly abnormal. It was easily visible. We'll do a few upshots, close shots of these. Classic diagnosis. This is out of the textbook. So I literally saw this about a month and a half ago. This person came in. These are typical boards questions again. A few pills in there. And that's a site of a biopsy that my fellow did. And OK, so let's stop the video and go on. So now your question. These are the biopsies. Right here is a biopsy. You can see next slide, please. So the most likely etiology for the diarrhea is this common variable immune deficiency associated with a colonic lymphoma. Could that be early lymphoma? Is that CMV colitis? Is that melanosis colide? Lymphomatoid papulosis of the colon? or acute colonic Crohn's, early Crohn's disease presenting. What's your diagnosis? Melanosis, good call. So that's classic melanosis coli. And this person uh, had melanosis coli. It's uh, pigments not uniform. It's more intense in the cecum and the proximal colon compared to the distal colon. But what you get is a starry sky appearance. And that's in the rectosigmoid region. And that's what I was showing in this particular thing. And it's lipofuscin is really the pigment that's depositive. And that was the actual biopsy showing lipofuscin. And herbal retinitis often have it in. But it's interesting to know, and the reason I brought this up is the usual cascara, senna, aloe, and rhubarb are associated it, with it. But it's also been seen in IBD. And Daryl Party, along with Bill Tremaine, reported this association in patients with IBD. They looked at about 25 patients overall. Uh, 25, uh, all of them had uh, IBD, 18 UC Crohn's. The distribution was variable. The extent of the Crohn's was variable as well. The medications, only five had laxatives. So this can occur independent of laxative use, and it's an important to recognize. The different laxatives that were associated with its use, they reported, and the location was variable. So remember to ask about herbal remedies. This patient had no herbal remedy taken, and it persists for up to nine months after the use of the uh, particular medication that has the uh, laxative in it. So those were hopefully food for thought, if you would, and these were some unknowns. You did great. I'd like to congratulate you. These are not easy videos. So with that, we're going to ask the panel to come up, and we're going to ask some questions that we have from the audience. And uh, Russell, lead us. 